Okay, thanks uh, and good morning and evening, everybody. Uh, I have the privilege of having known about sci uh, the scientific work that Brian has done for at least 40 years. And I've had the privilege of working very closely either with him or for him uh, for about 35 of those years. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how Brian changed the world of cattle breeding. So uh, I'm going to start a little bit earlier than Hadley was suggesting, uh, back to Jay Lush, who started at Iowa State in 1930, and in 1932 published the book Animal Breeding Plans, the first textbook about animal breeding. And it was very much a big picture description about how breeding would be done and all of the aspects of it. And he introduced some key concepts like how to predict genetic gain based on the key equation. And he communicated a lot about the concepts of index selection. He had two or many PhD students, but two that are of interest to us at his uh, time at Iowa State. And, and one of them was C.R. Henderson, who, uh, who immediately after the war started his, his PhD in mid-career and graduated in 1948. And the other one was A.L. Ray from Massey University who overlapped at the same time with uh, Dr. Henderson. And Dr. Henderson zoned in, zoomed in on the theory and application of prediction and variance component estimation. That's heritabilities and correlations. So a much smaller focus than Lush's animal breeding plans, which had everything to do with genetic improvement. And uh, he invented the mixed model equations, a form of which I show you on the right-hand side, although he didn't know matrix algebra at the time and didn't use that kind of notation until much later. He only ever had one sabbatic leave from his time at Cornell, where he started immediately after his PhD. And that was to New Zealand to collaborate with our Ray and to jointly spend time with the Dairy Board Farm Production Division. He did that in 1955 and worked closely with somebody in the Dairy Board called Shale Searle, a farmer, uh, farmer's son from Taranaki, who showed Dr. Henderson that the mixed model equations he'd have invented were best linear unbiased predictions. Um, okay, next slide, thanks, sorry having a bit of trouble here advancing the slides. So then Shale Searle went back to Cornell uh, and did his PhD. He graduated in 1958, and he focused even more narrowly than Henderson had on uh, the proofs that underpin prediction and variance component estimation. And he built on the foundation of first proving that the mixed model equations were BLUP, which although they were discovered in 1955 during Henderson's time with the Dairy Board, weren't actually published until the landmark paper in 1959. And after that, he, uh, he, he got a bit tired of the Dairy Board in Wellington and went back to Cornell in 1962, where he was on the faculty for many years after that. Thank you. So uh, why am I bothering to tell you all of that ancient history? Well, the reason is right down there at the bottom is that Brian did his PhD at Cornell uh, with Henderson and Searle. So uh, Brian Wickham was right there in this time where Lush's concepts had narrowed down to Henderson's mixed model equations to Shale's proofs. And, uh, and Brian did his PhD on sire evaluation using selected records. So one of the critical considerations at the time was could you evaluate animals correctly when there was a whole lot of selection going on? So when the only cows that were measured in the, select, in the second lactation were the best ones that had been in the first lactation, could you do those things properly? And that was the subject of Brian's PhD. And many others followed, uh, followed the steps to Cornell after Brian and Allison's uh, initial footsteps there. And the one that immediately came after them was Robert Anderson. And uh, Robert Anderson arrived in 75 and he, and he sent me an email the other day. And I thought this was kind of interesting. Shale Searle had a very explosive personality at times. 
And Robert said to Shao one time, several weeks ago, you told me you couldn't understand the Pukelsheim paper, very important paper in uh, the statistical area. And he said, I now have some idea, and I thought a numerical case might provide some further insight to explain to Shale this paper. And Shale said, what the hell do you think you're doing? I had high hopes for you, but appears you are just another computer lick, Nick, like many other students. I suggest you pack your bags and take your wife and children back to New Zealand. Uh, now, I put that quote in there both because it shows Shale's personality, but it's also a kind of statement that followed Brian and various other parts of his career when there were suggestions that he should pack his bags and his wife and head back to New Zealand as well. So uh, that's kind of where I would think about things. And, and I worked on, on BLUP, and so I would be considered, I guess, a BLUPer. So the mixed model equations would be to me, perhaps, the very heart or the hub of animal breeding. And I've put them there in the center of that circle. And uh, people like me, at least in our early time, just took it for granted that surrounding that hub were other activities that were well looked after, like pedigree data and herd testing and reproduction and research and a breeding scheme and a business proposition. And that, that blup that I might consider to be the central aspect would represent the process where uh, data from somewhere is manufactured into information to support some decision. So that was my view of the world, but that's very different from Brian's view of the world. So despite the fact his PhD was on uh, sire selection, uh, he was really... Uh, the center of a hub, which uh, he put, he, he basically demoted the actual genetic evaluation part. I've called it sire evaluation rather than BLUP because BLUP didn't, uh, didn't develop in New Zealand for at least another 15 years after the time that Brian came back from, uh, from Cornell. Um, I've put Brian in the, in the center there, but Brian's a pretty humble person for those of you that know him. And, uh, and, and you may have heard some of the things that he's been doing. The, the focus on all of his activities was never about Brian. So I guess to give you a, a, an analogy, you could think of Brian as being the composer and Brian as being the conductor but he wanted you to listen to the music the orchestra was presenting rather than focus on him himself. So while he had a whole lot of activities in LIC where I put him in the middle of the hub there and then at ICBF and Interval and so on, they were never about him. They were about that concept of changing data into information. So uh, one of the interesting issues was that he had this impact on farm profit. Uh, or at least in the early days, we talked about it for farm profit. Now we're a little bit more general in talking about whether it's good for farmers, because some things can be good for farmers without necessarily being about farm profit. So the, the milestone for measuring whether you should do anything was about whether it should be good for farmers. And I think that came up a number of times in the talks this morning. So think of Brian in the middle, the hub of this wheel. This wheel needs to be in balance. So if any of the spokes on that wheel are, are weak, then the wheel will wobble along and uh, go from side to side. We need it to spin truly. And if some of the spokes are longer than the others, then you're going to have a bumpy ride. And what I believe Brian did a lot for the, uh, for the science of and implementation of cattle breeding was to make sure those spokes were all aligned. And so you have to concentrate on the ones that are the weakest part of it. And, and those various uh, sire evaluation, herd testing data, reproduction, research, breeding scheme, business proposition, interval, they are all part of the spokes that Brian worked on. And in his early days in New Zealand, coming back from Cornell, I think he identified that there were several weak spokes. One was the lack of a national database. And so he was instrumental, as you've heard, in putting that together. Another one which you haven't heard any talk about is how important it was to use bulls widely. 
And in order to use balls widely, you had to have good semen technologies. And to get good semen technologies, you had to study things like conception rate. And by creating a database that recorded all of the mating and other events, allowed LIC to mine that data and come up with ways to extend bull semen to make more cows pregnant. And that all rode on the shoulders of the database systems that Brian put in there. Another important point was finding uh, elite bull mothers. And, uh, and Brian was, uh, was instrumental in, in using bull mothers that came from commercial herds, not necessarily registered animals, as long as they had three generations of AB mating. And that had a huge impact on increasing the rate of gain in New Zealand. And of course, international collaboration. Okay, so get that wheel spinning. So, uh, Brian, right throughout all of the activities that I've ever been involved with him, he, he has done three things. He started off by always acknowledging where is it we are up to right at the moment. And there are lots of other people that, around the world that do that. They point out the things that are wrong with where we are right at the moment. So they think about where we are. But the second thing that you need to do is, uh, which not everybody does, is then identify and communicate where you want to be. And Brian has done this right from his early, early stages. And uh, lots of people do that too. They identify where they are and where they want to be. But Brian has done the third thing as well, and that's to decide and to orchestrate everything that you need to get there and then repeat the recipe. And he's repeated that recipe. He's designed the spokes of that wheel numerous times at LIC at Interval at ICBF and then back again at NZAEL. So through the 1990s, he was involved in further refinement of the database, the development of the across breed animal model, the BLUP system that you heard about from Bevan, the development of the national breeding objective, which came about from having an across breed evaluation that Peter Raymer has talked to you about, and then the development of microsatellite markers and searching for QTL, the MIL QTL project that Richard Spellman talked to you about. And he's had to add many more spokes to the wheel, and that wheel has gained more and more inertia as time has gone on. And now I've shown you that there are two Brian's in the middle because now he was achieving twice as much as he was before because as he got this wheel walking, he then got it to be running. And you'll also notice that I haven't changed the picture of Brian in there either because as I've known him over his career, his haircuts changed once or twice. His glasses have changed a few times uh, and he might have shed the tie that he used to wear all the time in his early days, but he's pretty much looks much the same for all the 30, 40 years that I have known of him. Um, so I, I recently read this uh, little note on something that uh, Brian had communicated to me and he was talking about, uh, about data sharing and he was saying, the model for data sharing gets right away from the currently and totally impractical model with every service user having a data supply and access agreement with every other service user. And although this was written in a recent context, it's something that I think has been uh, a critical part of Brian's thinking right back from the 1970s. This was the concept that led to the, to the LIC national database concept of bringing together all the data. It's what he, uh, what he then put in place with Interval for sharing data between all the partners. It's what he did in ICBF, and it's uh, again what he has been promoting through, uh, through NZAEL. So something else hasn't been talked about so much. Brian has always been an earlier adopter of technology and organization. And, and those of us that worked with them in the early days will remember every meeting had a folder and it had color coded uh, numbers and so on. And you, you had to struggle to walk down one of the halls at LIC because the corridor was full of uh, a bookcase with all of the folders from all of these meetings that he had in the past. But he very quickly moved to digital uh, systems as that, uh, method became available. He was one of the first adopters of the cell phone, one of the first people around to use a laptop. 
and to use it for, uh, for, for doing more than just looking at your diary and the time. Uh, he made widespread use of email, uh, rapidly adopted word processing, and I can't think of any other person that has sent me a document in Word that has used more advanced features than Brian. So a lot of people, you know, they hit the space bar to indent something and they, uh, and they type numbers in and Brian was uh, using styles for headings and automatic table of contents numbering and recording of document sources, all of those things for a long time. Same with spreadsheets. He had spreadsheets sent would have data filters and mail mergers and those kind of things. And his online, uh, online meetings, links and document cloud-based filing systems. Brian jumped on anything that would improve system efficiency and all of the things that he was working on. So then uh, Brian went to ICBF late 1990s. And you've already heard that it was a blank slate. There was not much there, a very fragmented breeding sector. And, and Brian rapidly reinvented the next generation of what had been his New Zealand activities. So I think it might have been easier for him that, uh, that the, the organization was fragmented because it had just allowed him to very quickly come in place and create all of those spokes that he needed. And now you'll notice there are three Brian's driving that because his uh, ability to get all these things done with the new technologies was, uh, was so much more having the experience that he had uh, up until that time. He kept adding more spokes to the wheel, a focus on education and training. So there weren't too many uh, adequately trained scientists in Ireland at that time. He had to go across the border to Northern Ireland to get Andrew Cromie, the first uh, scientist he had on his team. And then he very actively worked to promote education of PhD students within Ireland. And although he did go to other places to get people like Victor Alori, I think from, uh, from Edinburgh and Thierry Pablo from, uh, from France, he has a very impressive team of, uh, of Irish born and, and bred uh, PhD students that are now scientists in the organization there. He did more collaboration nationally, collaborated with animal traceability and abattoirs, probably all part of his original vision that he might have had for New Zealand. Uh, also collaborated internationally, uh, both within Europe and elsewhere, and included beef, cattle and sheep, which I think were probably also things that he'd had in mind when he originally set up livestock improvement database systems in New Zealand. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that was a vision that was around when herd improvement was renamed as livestock improvement as the database was first being created. And he did all that creating an industry good business from the information system that represented all of those activities. There are a whole lot of other very useful Wickham attributes that he's brought to the world of cattle breeding. He's always been prepared to put up a straw man as a starting point. No point having a meeting where there's something to start discussion about. He's always been prepared to change to any new justifiable direction. So if, uh, if somebody can suggest that something he's doing is not the best way to do it and he accepts their view, then he will rapidly change. Uh, he's always been prepared to try something that's promising but is as yet unproven. I have never been to a meeting with Brian where there hasn't been an agenda, where there hasn't been all of the documents you require to consider the issues, where there hasn't been minutes afterwards and action lists and follow-up items. And those of you that have been involved recently with him in NZAU will know often it's only 15 minutes to half an hour after the meeting that we receive the complete draft minutes from that meeting because he's been typing them while, uh, while, while we're on the Zoom meeting. In fact, it's often been quite annoying when he hasn't muted his microphone because you hear all the clicking of his little fingers uh, on the keyboards. And he's been very good at getting everybody running on this treadmill. This wheel is like a treadmill and he's been orchestrating everybody on it. And he might start being the only one on it, but he seems to be able to encourage everybody else to get on there with him. And before long, there's a whole team which makes the wheel move much faster. 
and he's even been able to reduce the number that try to run in the other direction on the treadmill, either because they've fallen off the side or because they've uh, decided that the direction everybody else was running was the right way to go. And you might wonder with all of these things that he's been, been doing in, in work, you know, what happens at home? But he has still found a lot of time for family and to do his share of home handyman activities. You, you might not know that while he was involved in a whole lot of NZAL activities, he was uh, renovating the, the house in Hamilton and making major structural changes. And a lot of the changes he, were, he made would be ones that professional tradesmen would be very proud of. Um, Brian's world in retirement, he established a consultancy business and he worked as uh, Secretary General for ICAR for a little while and some consulting activities, including assisting NZAEL with dealing some opportunities and challenges. And when he looked at the things that, uh, that were challenges there, that led to him doing um, what was more or less full-time work, but, uh, but probably much more than full-time work. The LIC, uh, sorry, the New Zealand system, information system in Bryant's absence. So in that time that he got that wheel up and spinning at LIC, he went away and got that wheel up and spinning at ICBF. Uh, what had happened in New Zealand? Well, the first thing was that some of the industry goods spokes on that LIC wheel had been lost uh, and some of the roles had been passed over to Dairy New Zealand. But uh, the Dairy New Zealand NZA wheel had not really been spun up. So yes, it had a database diagad. Yes, it had an evaluation system, uh, which was uh, basically the old LIC one, but it hadn't been going around the circuit of the spokes and making sure there were balance and all of those kind of things that Brian has been so good at. So Brian's world from 2019 onwards uh, this part-time activity helping out uh, NZAL was really achieving the work of about four people, um, look, the, looking after the, uh, the transfer of that DIGAD database, which hadn't had all of the functionality added to it, as you heard earlier. So making sure that that extra functionality got added to it so that data from breed associations and CRV could come directly into DIGAD rather than via LIC. Uh, developing an open and transparent system of animal evaluation, what has become known as NZAEL 3.0 and NZAEL 3.5. 3.0 with the uh, pedigree-based systems will be becoming live in December, where all of the tra traits have been revamped and 3.5, including genomics, planned for December of next year. He's been a very strong supporter for greater adoption of genomics in many aspects of the industry and a driver of innovation in all aspects of the information business. So Brian's NZAEL legacy, he's spun up the uh, NZAEL wheel uh, in a very, very short time. And you can be assured, Brian, that keeping it spinning is in safe hands, but it's gonna take uh, at least eight of them to, uh, to, to look after the, the ones that, that your pair were doing. So Ted Coates, Dave McCall, Cam Nielsen, and myself have token, taken over various parts of the roles that uh, Brian was doing directly, and we will make sure that thing just keeps on running. So changing the world of cattle breeding, Jay Lush established the science of animal breeding Henderson invented the statistical approaches to animal evaluation. Shale Searle brought logic and proof into computational methods and discipline into his students. Brian Wickham put the D of R&D into livestock systems alongside and in balance with the R part. Brian Wickham did not just change the world of cattle breeding. Brian Wickham defined the world of cattle breeding both nationally in the 1890s in New Zealand, then in Ireland and globally via ICAR and Interval. Thanks very much, Brian.